Hello guys, Brian here. Welcome to another edition of Out of Turn 4. It's a big, big episode this week. I'm sure um, in the past 24 hours you have seen the crazy news that has come out of NASCAR. Um, I don't even think I have to say what's coming up on the show. I think you know what's coming up on the show. You won't exactly know my rea- you might know my reaction, but you might not, um, but we're gonna give it anyway. We will, of course, um, also recap Indy Lights at Mid-Ohio, what that means for IndyCar in 2022, after the championship was decided this past weekend at Mid-Ohio. Um, we'll also have a little bit of silly season news, mostly IndyCar's- NASCAR side's been a little quiet, um, so... We won't have much on the NASCAR side. And then, of course, we will have our weekend predictions for the NASCAR weekend at the Charlotte Roval. But, of course, we start with a historic NASCAR weekend at Talladega. Starting with the Truck Series, the only race that went the full distance this entire weekend, should I note. And Tate Fogelman of Young's Motorsports. Yes, you heard that right. Tate Fogelman is your winner at Talladega in the Truck Series. Of course, he got it maybe in a little bit of a controversial way. Um, he, of course, got it by wrecking John Hunter Nemechek in the Trioval, which I'm sure a lot of people won't like. Maybe, you know, I haven't seen much. I've only seen the replay at one angle, so I, I don't want to make a total judgment based on what I saw on that one angle. Um... You know, but I will say that's not a way to get a win, but congratulations to Tate Fogelman. If it is what I think happened, and Tate Fogelman deliberately took out the four, that is not a way to get a win, and frankly, I'm a little, I mean, I'm happy for him, but at the same time, that's not the way to earn respect, and that's not the way to race your fellow competitors, so that that would be my comment as far as that goes. But nonetheless, congratulations to Tate Fogelman. He kicks off the weekend with a win. Then, of course, just a little later on, we had the NASCAR Xfinity Series at Talladega. Kind of a new race because this race never ran in the fall before last year. And it looks like they kept it for this year. Um, Brandon Brown he was the winner after a rain delay, which led to the race going into the darkness and the darkness leading to the race being called short. So, Brandon Brown is the winner. And this is huge for Brandon Brown. Brandon Brown and Ryan Sieg essentially have the same same but different backgrounds, I'm sure. I don't want to say exact same, but I will say that they've had similar um, ways up to the NASCAR Xfinity Series. Family-run team, little sponsorship... You know, um, and needless to say, they've had to be creative to get their um, way up through the ranks. So congratulations to Brandon Brown. I'm happy to see that. That that was one of my favorite moments of the weekend. Um, of course, you know, um, not much I can say on this um, other than congratulations to him. Of course, you may have remembered his uh, car salesman advertising of sponsorship on the car, or in an attempt to get sponsorship on the car. That was pretty creative. This team is creative. They've worked hard this year, maybe deserved a playoff spot, but nonetheless, a win is a great way to at least get momentum for next season. All right, on to the big moment of the weekend, and this one is huge. Um, Of course, um, NASCAR Cup Series at Talladega just finished up a few hours ago. I'm recording on Monday night, really, before the football game. So, um, of course, we're getting to the end of Stage 2. NASCAR, or... Crew Chiefs telling their teams, hey, rain is coming, rain is coming. It's like five minutes out, and we just had absolute craziness, which led to a spin by Ryan Priest. 
Um, big wreck, Ryan Priest, William Byron, Matt DiBenedetto brings out the final caution of the day with five laps of racing to go in the stage. And guess who was the leader? It was none other than 2311 Racing's Bubba Wallace out in front. Um, Daryl Wallace Jr. would lead under the caution. Um, then the lightning would come into play. The heavy rain would attack turns one and two, causing a red flag. And needless to say, rain stopped. Turn one and turn two was soaked. A 2.6 mile super speedway. You can imagine just how long that would take to dry. They said an estimate of two hours. So chances were we were going to go back racing about when we're recording this podcast yesterday. Um, or when you're watching this. At the time of which you're watching this. So it would have been about 5 o'clock. Sunset at 6.30. Still a full stage to go. Not even stage 2 wrapped up. Should I note. So of course it would have been an extended caution. In which the leaders would have pitted. Excuse me. Um, the leaders would have pit. You know they would have had to give time for the leaders to pit. And then, of course, they would have had to have, you know, stage end, yada, yada, yada. It, it would have been a very lengthy caution, to say the least. And then, of course, you would have had 70-something laps to go till the checkered. We were going to run into another situation where they were going to cut the race short due to um, darkness. So, at the end of the day... Um, they get the jet dryers out, um, the rain picks up again, and NASCAR decided, you know what, we're not going to get this race done before darkness, Bubba Wallace is your winner. So, Dar uh, Bubba Wallace is the winner at Talladega, the second ever African American driver to win in the NASCAR Cup Series, and the first win in 57 years since Wendell Scott did it in 1964. And of course, this all this win is also significant for Michael Jordan, the NBA's goat. He is the first, or he is the first African American owner to win, first full time African American owner to win in the NASCAR Cup Series since 1973. Based on everything I saw, this race was not very entertaining. It was kind of, you know, I mean, the racing at the end was entertaining, but it was just. You know, nothing special. Typical Talladega. Um, no lie, I wish that race had gone to the conclusion. Let's see what would have happened. I wish maybe it got a little bit deeper. You know, so... Ultimately, I just wish we got more out of it. I am happy for Bubba Wallace. And, you know, for those naysayers out there who say he didn't deserve to win, he got handed a win... Guess what? He was in the right place at the right time. And another thing is, I didn't see um, these people have an issue when Joey Logano won his first career race in the rain. I didn't see these people have issues when Jimmy Johnson won in the rain. And should I also point out that yesterday, or on Saturday, that these people did not have an issue with Brandon Brown winning? Um, I don't, I don't want to point and get political and say something that will certainly get me fired. But should I just say that you guys didn't have a problem with those races ending in the rain? Um, so what's the problem here? That's my question. Again, probably a statement that will get me fired tomorrow. But just thought I'd throw that out there. What's the problem with yesterday's win so um that's i'm just gonna poise pose that question this may be the last out of turn four you guys ever see if i do get canned so i just want to throw that out there again i wish bubba had won it in the full distance i agree on that point but you know i i will say though he earned this win and he deserves it after all the adversity. And keep in mind, we've had three new cup teams in the last, or entering this season. Trackhouse Racing, we had 
um, fast, or we had um, Live Fast Motorsports, which I believe is BJ McLeod's team. I couldn't think of the name. I was about to say Go Fast Racing. And then, of course, you have 2311. Obviously, high expectations were surrounding, un unobtainable. Actually, that's more the word to describe it. Bubba Wallace entered the season with unobtainable um, standards and unobtainable goals of winning races, making the playoffs, and quite frankly, competing for a championship for a first-year team. This team is not the, the third rendition of Furniture Row Racing. This team is not the second rendition of Levine Family Racing. This team is not a fifth car of Joe Gibbs Racing. This is a new team guys okay this is a brand new team and say what you will but they've had to work just as hard as team Trackhouse and just as hard as live fast motorsports has had to work to get to this point okay they've had to work just as hard they've had just as equal the growing pains as those teams have had so at the end of the day though the difference is those teams did not have high expectations entering this season. We did not have any expectations for B.J. McLeod's team, okay? Let's be fair. I expected that team to be a backmarker battling with Rick Ware Racing every weekend. And frankly, other than a couple of good finishes here and there, that's about where they've averaged. Excuse me. Um, now, let's look at... Um, Let's look at Team Trackhouse here. Daniel Suarez has put up top 10s, top 5s. He's had some impressive runs, but he hasn't won. Okay? And again, not expected. This team was expected to run mid-pack at best. Now, Daniel Suarez has outperformed the equipment, and it would have been great to see him get a victory. It will be great if he does get a victory before the end of the season, but it's not expected. Again, Keep in mind, that's also a Chevy team under an alliance with Richard Childress Racing. Um, compare that to BJ McLeod and Stuart Haas Racing, much like Go Fast's deal. Um, so again, Joe Gibbs Racing Toyota partner, or TRD partnered with Bubba Wallace in 2311. And with two powerhouse owners expected to win out of the gates which was an unrealistic, unobtainable standard, okay? Even Denny Hamlin called that. Um, there was so much adversity on this team from the start compared to the other two new teams. Unfair, nonetheless. Unfair expectations. And to get the win, they've earned it. It doesn't matter if it rained at the end of the day. It doesn't matter if the race got canned halfway through. Um... Frankly, it doesn't matter how they want it. The fact is they want it. Now, if they want it by wrecking someone, I'd be saying the same thing that I said about Tate Fogelman. But needless to say, they earned this win. Okay? Like it or not, they earned this win. Okay? Again, like it or not, they earned it. You can say whatever you want in the comments. You can dispute me. Um, I'm sure I'm going to be getting a lot of comments about how I may have just pointed out something pretty bad. But, you know, again, I do apologize for that. But I'm going to tell you that, again, I, I'm just pointing out what I'm seeing on social media. So, again, might get fired after this week. Who knows? This may be the last episode of Out of Turn 4. So, anyway, let's move forward here to the Indy Lights at Mid-Ohio. Kyle Kirkwood is the winner at Mid-Ohio. Anyway, he wraps up the... Or, Kyle Kirkwood won the first race. He finished fifth in the second race at Mid-Ohio. My mistake. He did win the Indy Lights Championship. And with that, of course, comes a $1.3 million scholarship into the... NTT IndyCar Series for 2022, so we know for a fact he will run at least three to four races in IndyCar in 2022. Chances are one of them will, if it is part-time, chances are it will be the Indy 500 and a couple of other events here and there. 
But nonetheless, Kyle Kirkwood will run. Chances are I'm hearing Andretti will likely be the destination to drive that number 29, which would be great, honestly. And, of course, he's going to be one of the uh, top. I think he's going to be, and I, I know it's still early. To make, it's still way too early to make a bold prediction, but he, without a doubt, is going to be the most highly coveted rookie in a long time. Now, I mean, compare that to Jimmy Johnson, who, of course, based on name, was the reason why, or based on um, name and platform, is why he got so much attention. But I think equal attention should be put on Kyle Kirkwood because he has had, in a way, his own record-setting pace getting to the top here. You know, he's had to work his way up from the bottom of Indy, of Road to Indy. He won championships in every length of the Road to Indy, which is something no driver has ever done. And to be honest, he is going to be one of the most highly touted rookies entering 2022. I wouldn't even be shocked if he does sign with Andretti and he starts winning out of the gates. I wouldn't be shocked because this guy, Kyle Kirkwood, seems like the kind of guy who is a hell of a racer and you have to be to get to this point and win a championship at every step of the way. So, again, keep an eye on Kyle Kirkwood. He is going to be a star in the IndyCar series. Um, again, I know it's very early to make that prediction, but he is going to be a star, and I sure hope Andretti retains him to team with Colton Herta, Alexander Rossi, and Roman Grosjean. So we'll see what happens in the coming weeks. I imagine possibly, even before this video is released, we might have an announcement on Kyle Kirkwood's future. Um, maybe even later this week, maybe next week, maybe in the coming weeks or months. Who knows, but I imagine he will be driving an Andretti car without question. And this IndyCar rookie class could get very interesting, to say the least. Um, of course, Malukas will probably be an IndyCar as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see where he lands. Of course, he does not have the $1.3 million in scholarship money. Um, so he is going to have to earn his way through... Um, based on his driving ability and, of course, marketability. All right, anyway, let's move on to some silly season news while we got time. Um, it was just announced today, Takuma Sato has said he is 50-50 about returning to IndyCar for 2022, hinting at a possible retirement. Um, you know, he's up there in age. It doesn't shock me. I would love to see him come back for the Indy 500, though. Maybe Team Penske will give him that opportunity because, again, Penske already lost a ride. To, um, Simon Paginaud went to Meyer and Shank Racing. So chances are he won't be... Uh, or so chances are, I don't know if they're going to fill that seat or not. But assuming they don't, you know, Sato might have a seat available for Indy if uh, Penske decides to go and field a fourth car at the Indy 500. Um... You know, so it would be nice to see Sato run that. We'll see what happens. Um, but this might just put a dent in my prediction that he was going to go to Dale Coyne Racing. Now, you got to imagine another seat just opened up for Ryan Hunter Ray. Two seats, possibly. And, of course, we'll talk about the other one in just a moment. But, you know, man, a changing of the guard is about to happen in IndyCar. And I think this all but confirms that Jack Harvey will be the driver of the number 30 for next season. Um, we mentioned another seat that might be available to Ryan Hunter Ray, and we're going to discuss that one right now. As Sebastian Bourdais has just announced he will run IMSA full time in 2022. Um, and with that, he has also announced that he will scale back his IndyCar schedule. For 2022, meaning that a seat will be open at AJ Foyt Racing. It, it is also believed that Sebastian Bourdais will run in a car for AJ Foyt. Again, they're also exploring going to a three-car three-car organization. Um, so I imagine 
you know, he might drive the 11. Maybe Charlie Kimball finds funding to go full-time racing and drive the 14. That's a possibility. Another possibility, Tatiana Calderon in the number 14 for next season. Keep in mind, Rokit is already a sponsor of hers. So, again, adding to the rookie class. Maybe Ryan hunter Ray, but it seems like DHL is not going to follow him, so he's going to have to search for sponsors. But again, if he if they can land Ryan hunter Ray, you know, maybe that third car could very well be a split between Sebastian Bourdais and Charlie Kimball for next season. You never know. Um, but I believe without a doubt, that Tatiana Calderon is is for sure a favorite to land that ride for next season. We'll see what happens again. She she would be an interesting pick because again, um, you know she's already tested for him. You know she's got seat time in an Indy car, and of course we add another female to the grid, which would be even greater, I think. So we'll see. Um, again, what happens in the coming days, coming weeks here. Um, let's get on to the predictions now. Let's start with the Xfinity Series at the Roval. I'm sticking, the, or I'm staying the course here. I'm going to go A.J. Allmendinger. He's going to win at the Roval. Um, he's won it, I believe, twice now. Um, so, again, I, I like his chances here. And plus, again, Colleg is still on a roll. Say what you want about Colleg Racing. They are still on a roll in this Xfinity Series. And to be honest, I think they're better than Team Penske right now. Um, as far as the Cup Series at the Roval, I'm going to go Kyle Larson. So a little change of pace here. It seems like everywhere we've gone where Chase Elliott's had a decent winning streak, Kyle Larson's been better. Um, you know, the road courses especially. I mean, he outpaced Chase Elliott at Sonoma. He outpaced him at the Glen. Granted, Chase Elliott got sent to the rear at Watkins Glen and had a tough road back to the front. So, again, I think this race falls in Kyle Larson's hands. Um, and it'll be an interesting weekend. Alex Bowman, um, William Byron, going to have to win to get in to the next round. You know, um, no one is locked in other than Denny Hamlin entering this race, which is even more shocking because Kyle Larson wrecked at Talladega and could not rebound after that wreck. So, very interesting weekend as we head to an elimination weekend at the Roval. We want to thank you for watching. We hope you'll uh, like or dislike, subscribe, and also be sure to comment your thoughts on the previous weekend, the Silly Season News, and on Kyle Kirkwood's future in IndyCar. We hope to hear from you guys, and we hope to be back with you next Tuesday, assuming I didn't just cancel myself on this network. All right, guys, until next Tuesday, goodbye, everyone.